The following interview was conducted with Gerald D. Bottoms, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Physiology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November 9, 2009, Stewart Center, 263. The, or the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning and good afternoon, Dr. Bottoms. Good morning. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, let's start out. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents and early years and going on from there to education, high school and college. Uh, okay, just a quick summary of these, Katie, and I, I may forget a lot of things, but uh, I'll try to fill them in if it is sure. better. And You're doing well. Okay, go ahead. In 1930, in uh, Holdenville, Oklahoma, a small farming community, uh, a small family. I had one brother and one sister, and my uh, mother and father, we were a close-knit family, hard-working family, and uh, I guess uh, my early years kind of set the stage for things that came later in life. Uh, you know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and uh, uh, life uh, early in those years for in Depression days and a little later were, were hard for lots of people. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I guess we learned some very valuable le lessons during that time. Uh, we basically learned uh, survival skills. We learned how to... Uh, respect to other people and the value of family and close friends and so forth. So uh, uh, I, I was born on a farm, raised on a farm, and uh, really life wasn't easy and totally different than my children can, uh, can't even believe in grandchildren can uh, sure. hardly say, no, Pop's not another story like that. <laughs> but, uh, life wasn't easy, you know. Sure. Raised in a home with no electricity, no running water, no refrigerator. And he said, well, how did you keep milk? <laughs> it wasn't easy, but we survived. Right, exactly. What was grade school like? And tell us about what high school was like, too. Okay, well, well, grade school was, uh, was, was great. All school, I always enjoyed school. Because uh, it was a chance to get away from the hard farm life some sure. days, at least a few hours of the day. But... Uh, Oh, I started the first grade in school in 1936. Uh, I, I don't know whether you're interested in this story or not. But Go ahead, I, sure. Research. I, Go ahead. I was a youngster, very young and very naive. And, uh, uh, you know, it was a country school, and I uh, found a seat in the, uh, on the back, a back seat in a row next to a huge coal-fired furnace. And it had a, a fire protection around it. And... Uh, you know, I was sitting uh, right beside that furnace, and I could easily slide my chair behind the furnace. And I will never forget my first grade teacher. Uh, quite often during class, I would take my chair and slide behind the furnace where she couldn't see me. And <laughs> I couldn't, Playing uh, trick-or-treat or something like that, you know, you know hide I, me, right. <laughs> very soon she said, I think someone's behind that furnace. <laughs> so I'd been caught. Oh my gosh, she's <laughs> pretty observant. On memory, but uh, I learned that I should uh, get out from behind the furnace and pay attention to what she was saying. Sure, I understand. So, yeah. uh, grade school again was lots of fun. I enjoyed playing in the recess activities as as much as everyone. I guess that was probably the highlight of our day at that time. Sure. Right. When you were, what year and month, uh, month uh, was your birth date? You were born in 1930. What month were you born in? Uh, April the 10th, 1930. Okay, great. Uh-huh. And, uh... So go ahead. Uh, anyway, the, you know, the rest of my uh, second grade, uh, well, grade school was sure. uneventful. I was a, a, a quiet, uh, although maybe not as quiet as I thought it was at times, but uh, uh, it was good. I, uh... Uh, was able to do well in uh, certainly mathematics and, uh, and the science courses, but uh, reading and grammar and things I didn't do so well, but uh, I guess it, it improved as time went sure. along a little. Uh, then next was high school. Do you want to make a couple comments about high school? Uh, high school, again, was uh, the same school. It was school where the, you know, a full 12 grades. All oh, Okay went all the way through in one school and uh, again high school was during world war ii years and mm -hmm. uh, things were not easy then uh, that's right things were not easy teachers were not abundant uh you know we had four teachers for the entire four years of high school it was a small country school and uh wow it was uh you know we 
really couldn't have much act, uh, athletic events because you couldn't get gasoline or tires to drive the buses right. to go on uh, ball trips and so forth. We did some, uh, but usually the farmers and their pickups would take us back and forth to some games and so forth. But but uh, time wasn't easy during World War II. This is a, 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 but again we survived. That's right. I, I know. Uh, Rubber uh, c- materials were impossible to get That's right. for vehicles, basketballs. I remember we had one basketball in high school that the boys and the girls played all of their games and practice used that one basketball. Was you know, it didn't last forever. No. And, and you couldn't buy a new one. There were none available. That's right. So we went a while without a basketball. But uh, anyway, I, again, I enjoyed uh, classes in high school. I enjoyed the uh, mathematics and science uh, courses. I probably asked a lot of questions that uh, I shouldn't have, but I wanted answers to them. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> but... Anyway, uh, high school, again, was rather uneventful. I did play, or attempted to play basketball in high school, but I wasn't that good. I made the traveling squad, but no heroic things accomplished during that time. I want to make a comment. One of the things that you sent me in preparation for this, I like this great one-liner. My definition of luxury was a pint of strawberry ice cream and an orange soda. That sounds good today. (laughs) <laughs> yes. I like strawberry ice cream anyway. <laughs> I still like it today. Uh, yes, yes, it was. You know, sure. it was a big double dip ice cream store in town, and you know, you got a double dip ice cream cone for ten, for five cents. There you go, exactly. Well, or after, soda for five cents. Yeah. After high school, I understand, then you went into the service. Is that right? You want to just make a couple com- make some comments about that? Yes, okay. I, I did. Okay. You know. Uh, Really, I joined the National Guard and when I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't, uh, wasn't a lot of money floating around, but uh, we had one night a week drill and they paid us. So it was quite well for that one night drill. In those days, we got $6 for the Pretty good. Uh, one drill a week, but that was our spending money through high school. And, uh, you know, and we had a summer camp in the summertime and made a little money there, so it was an opportunity to get out and see the world. And uh, really, it provided another. Immediately after I graduated from high school, uh, I wanted to go to college. I could not. It was absolutely no way I could go to college. But there was educational opportunities through the National Guard. Uh, I know uh, well, within three weeks after I graduated from high school, I was on my way to uh, on a National Guard for, uh, to Fort Benning, Georgia for a 16-week school uh, in auto mechanics and auto electricity. And uh, this was, was great for me. I got a chance to see the world. And uh, you know, I was 18 years old. It was terribly lonely during those 16 weeks, but I did survive it. And uh, uh, the, the National Guard things did well. I, I went to a couple of schools like that, and then by that time, uh, the Korean War advanced to the point that uh, mobilization was talk, and within two months we had orders to we were mobilized within the next three months. So uh, uh, this basically filled in the void there. Sure. Is it during the time? Right. Okay. Now, and after then, after your service, um, then what came next? Okay. Of course, I had a lovely young lady that I corresponded with all the time I was in service, and uh, and uh, I returned from service. And I guess uh, one of the things you asked about the, uh, you know, some uh, outstanding events in my life. Certainly, the return home from Korea was probably uh, a very outstanding event. And uh, I married Maxine soon after my return, and uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, that uh, was a highlight. You know, we traveled the world during that, uh, well, during the service time. Uh, some of, and it was all free travel. So. Sure, very good. <laughs> okay, and then I understand then the, the GI Bill helped along then after you got out of the service. Yes, uh, right. I'm ever grateful for the GI Bill, and I remember making up my mind while going through college and with a GI Bill and, and you know, it was $135 a month uh, and paid her tuition and, uh, uh, you know, it was, was great. And I remember telling myself, do not ever complain about paying income tax because look what the 
government has provided for you <laughs> form of educational opportunities. So I guess I, after years of paying income tax, I said that may have been a mistake thinking. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. Because sure. That's your perspective. And that you put it in that in that context in that time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, I did. And so uh, again, uh, I feel like that all the events, most of the events that happened in my life, happened for the good because. It, uh, I guess, uh, you know, we learn very early in life, you better take advantage of every opportunity offered to you because they probably won't come around the second That's time. That's right, exactly. And, there's uh, there's so no rain checks. I did try to take a, a beginning my return home. Maxine and I were married uh, soon after I got home. And I remember when I first got home, I, I went to work in the local Ford garage and uh, a very hot summer, working mainly on oil field trucks. And they were hot and greasy and and uh, I'd remember my battery commander before I left Korea and on the way home, the last, about the last thing I remember him telling me, Joe, when you get home, said the, uh, the government will pass a GI Bill for the Korean veterans when they do go to school. Well, that summer after I got home, went to work in the garage and it was very hot underneath some hot oily trucks working and hot grease dropping in your face. And about that time, the government passed a GI Bill for Korean veterans. And I decided I'm going to school. Good. Okay. What made your decision? How did you decide to go to? Um, you went to East Central State, huh? Yeah. Uh huh. So that was, uh, you know, that was the closest college to home. Oh, okay. All right. Where most everyone in that area there was was uh, wasn't a community college. It was a four-year uh, college and uh, a teacher's college, and uh, that was where most of the people. And you know. Uh, several of my army buddies that I'd been with for the past two years had returned about the same time I did, and, and many of us started East Central that fall. So mm -hmm. it was a close college and the uh, most reasonable place, and uh, it was a teacher's college, and at the time I wanted to teach. Sure, okay. Well, that was a good good start for you. Yes, it was, and my wife was out of, out of, just out of high school at the time, and uh, she we both started to college at the same time at East Central. and. Uh, Finished in, uh, went through in three years, attending summer school as well as academic year. And, uh, you know, I started out to be a history major, and I, I got a, a history teacher very early in my college career, and, and uh, it was ancient history, and boy, things went fast and furious, and, and I decided right quick I didn't want to, I didn't want to major in history. I was taking some math courses and, and physics courses because I'd, uh, those things appealed to me. And, they were easy compared to that ancient history class. I would think so, yeah, right. I decided the sciences was the way to go. And then I, I had a marvelous biology teacher uh, very early in my college and a uh, very difficult teacher. He gave lots of pop, pop quizzes, but he was an interesting man. And, and I fell in love with sciences and decided very soon that uh, I was going to major in sciences. And, uh, and thus I did. Finished high college East Central and then uh, started my uh, career teaching high school sciences. And, uh, you know, this was in the Sputnik days now, in the later 50s. And there was uh, lots of, uh, well, and still is, emphasis on science. And, uh, and uh, there were lots of opportunities for science teachers. And anyone with uh, any background in uh, the sciences to, for continued education, especially for teachers, because they were they didn't have many science teachers in those. Sure, All right, exactly. Lots of programs. National Science Foundation, NIH had uh, lots of programs available for high school science teachers to continue their education. And uh, you know, again, uh, along the same way, I was fortunate in obtaining support for my undergraduate degree through the GI Bill, for the master's degree by a fellowship from the National Science Foundation, and for my PhD by a fellowship from, or a pre-doctoral fellowship from the National Institutes of Health. So I was very fortunate I didn't have to go in debt. That's right. Um, I was going through college, and my wife was going to school most of the time also, and we started raising a family at that time also. Okay. Well, life was busy, but uh, full of uh, activities that were rewarding. Right. Sounds good. Okay. Um, now, do you want to talk a little about your experience at Purdue? And hey. first of all, how did you happen to get the uh, offer to come to Purdue? Well, uh, it's quite interesting. You know, I graduated in 1966 with a PhD, and again at that time, uh, 
heavy emphasis on the sciences, and there was lots of opportunities in universities and colleges. And and uh, I really, uh, I guess I give thought. I had interested interested in college work, but I was also interested in going to work for NASA because uh, uh, things were exciting in NASA at that time. Sure. I submitted an application to NASA. Oh, I think in December of. 65 and didn't hear anything from them and kind of forgot about it and uh, started to come early the next uh, in January and February I started receiving uh, invitations from various places and contacts that I had uh, uh, through uh, at various universities and I went for interviews and still holding out thing out here something from NASA uh, I, uh, I I went to uh, I came to Purdue and February, I believe, of 1966, okay. and uh, it was a beautiful day in February. It was cool and crisp, and the sun was shining, and uh, I had a great visit to Purdue. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Gatch, who was head of the department at the time, and, uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time with him and other members of the department, and things just really looked looked very nice at Purdue. The campus was beautiful. Uh, the department, the veterinary school, was very new at the time, and it still is. And the labs were spacious, and uh, they were available, and uh, opportunities just looked great. And uh, again, I, I wanted to teach, and I wanted to do research. And I really realized that, you know, you're probably not going to re excel in either one, but I wanted, uh, unless you concentrate on one totally, but. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to teach and I wanted to do some research, and it it was a marvelous opportunity. And it seemed like that uh, the administration was very willing to help you get started and down the road. So I remember after my first day of interview, I called my wife and I said, you know, I told her how much I like things there, and I said, if they offer me a job, I think we should seriously consider it. Well, uh, I was fortunate. Uh, the rest of the interview went well, and I went back home. And then, oh, I think within the next month, uh, within uh, two to four weeks, I had received a call from them asking me to join the faculty. And and I was late, elated, really. And my and I told Maxine, you know, it was a, it was a great place. Could be a great place to make a home and a great place for us to develop our to develop our careers. Uh, so um, things moved on for there, and then uh, we, I started to work uh, there, or my position started on July 1, uh, 1966. And uh, we moved there, and again, things uh, went fine. I thought it was, wasn't easy, it was busy, uh, but uh, you know, the opportunities to do some teaching and, and get, a, get a research program going, was uh, there were ample opportunities there to do it, and mm -hmm. I tried to take make the best of them. All right, and you started working with you got some ideas from some of the clinicians. You worked with them, and then from then, go ahead. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, and when I first started trying to organize a research program and get a lab up and going, and thinking about teaching course, some courses, um, there was uh, it was overwhelming. And the things that I needed to do in the research program, I just realized I didn't have the expertise in all the areas. My expertise were limited, and I, I thought, you know, I, I, I need a lot of help on a lot of these things. So I guess, uh, and again, there was encouragement from the administration at that time of, of the university. Cooperation is the way to go, and I guess sure. it uh, made an impression on me. I thought, you know, there's other people all around me that have worlds of talents that I don't have. And, uh, you know, we started talking, and one thing led to another. And, uh, and again, I realized that, as everyone knows, uh, competition for funding from a, uh, a national granting agency is not easy. Right. And you must have things in order. And I realized that it took more expertise than I had. So, uh, you know, I, I began to work on cooperation. I mean, other people that had areas that touched mine that were were very interesting. And uh, 
so I guess, uh, you know, computers were just coming on board. I knew absolutely nothing about computers. Sure. <laughs> I had office mates that knew a lot more about that. They, they loved to do the computer work, but th that was fine. So they got involved with the data analysis and, and uh, helping with the computer uh, calculations and things that I would have never been able to do. Right. Cooperation was fine. And then again, you know, uh, as part of my PhD research also, in those days there were no assays available for endocrine hormones and blood of animals. The only ones that were available were very crude, not reproducible, and, uh, you know, there were bioassays or assays that required very laborious extraction procedures and chromatography procedures, procedures to purify the, the extracts to the point that uh, uh, you could identify them. So uh, it, it, it wasn't easy. So, and again, you know, I was trying to assay for some hormones for some of the research labs and, and uh, first started talking to some clinicians that were uh, seeing endocrinology-related cases in the clinics, and they also had interest in being able to detect the levels of these hormones in the blood of these animals. Well, there just was no, it, it would take a full week. We start on a Monday morning with a group of five samples and if we were lucky, by the Friday night, we could have those, all the extraction procedures and uh, chromatography completed and trying to identify and quantitate the product. The results were all over the board and not reliable, and clinicians would have a case in the animal that would they'd wonder if this or that hormone might be uh, in, uh, out of balance and uh, then, you know, ask me about the possible assays for them. Well, I didn't have a good answer, but you know, about this time I was able to attend a conference on the East Coast in which uh, oh, Dr. Yellow, she uh, received a Nobel Prize for the first immunoassay for insulin, developing an immunoassay for insulin. I attended a conference there and heard her talk, and uh, she was so interesting. She started out with saying so simple that I could understand, and then she built on that, going through and talking about when she and her colleagues developed the radio assay for insulin, that uh, the paper they submitted to a journal, and the journal turned it down, and she took great pride, in, and she later received the Nobel Prize, for hmm. her. and uh, she made, had great pride in showing the letter that she got from the editors that had turned her paper down. <laughs> That's a classic. Yeah, keep those. A lot of them turned out also. Sure. sure. And I think of her when hers was turned out. But anyway, uh, it was she was later referred to. She received a Nobel Prize. I had a lot of articles published, but never received a Nobel Prize. Well, that doesn't right. it. I, that's okay. And not other recognitions. Yeah. So again, you know, that started initial contacts with clinicians. And again, I saw a place where. I could use my talents to maybe help them with some of the problems they were having in the clinics. And then that developed into a, oh, oh just a, a marvelous experience and uh, led to some useful uh, results. And then along the same time, you know, I, I had a graduate student, <coughs> excuse me, a new graduate student that came to me and uh, he wanted to do a research project for his master's degree on the, hemorrhagic shock because he had had some experience in the past and and uh, you know this was interesting to me also so we uh, started work uh, and uh, uh, developed his uh, it was a very simple procedure I don't remember many details at the time but we did the experiment he got his master's degree and about that time and as part of that procedure you know a lot of the assays were involved there <coughs> measuring hemodynamic and cardiorespiratory uh, parameters and uh, techniques that we found useful along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, talking with other clinicians and people, I began to realize that uh, really there was a, a major problem in large amount clinics. Uh, lots of uh, impactions and horses and uh, uh, leading to death in most all cases. It was, there were many problems involved, but one of the suspects was that endotoxin, as a result of intestinal blockage or obstructions, that endotoxins was leaking from the intestines into the bloodstream. So 
show and talking to the clinicians and the experiments, we uh, got started on endotoxic shock. And, uh, and along with these came the development of procedures that became useful and so many other things. Mm -hmm. I, I know uh, uh, we were able in these experiments to measure blood flow in animals at, at four different time periods during an experiment where we could measure the blood flow to basically every major organ in the body. That's uh, pretty mic good. Microspheres that were shaped about the size of a red blood cell, they wouldn't go through the capillary beds, but they would lodge. And uh, we could get those labeled with radioactive isotopes. And uh, you get batches of microspheres labeled with different isotopes. And the counting equipment that, by the way, uh, Purdue helped me obtain, and uh, along with some research grants, <clears throat> where we could separate uh, those isotopes in our counter, and we could determine what the blood flow was before the induction of the insult, and then one hour after, two hours after, and three hours after. So again, we had a technique here that provided some answers to the questions that we were looking at, at the time. We attempted, uh, and again, these techniques came in handy later on uh, for other opportunities that that appeared. Mm -hmm. And okay. again, at this time, you know, there was no way to assay for endotoxin in the blood of animals. And we really didn't know whether endotoxin was getting the blood or not of these suspected animals. So we started trying to work on assays to develop an assay for endotoxin. Very laborious, very time consuming, and very difficult. But we did finally get in a uh, an assay going that we had some confidence in. Um, I'll never forget uh, so many things in that setting experiment. Uh, they were doing some work in my lab at the time, and they were doing some drilling and uh, stirring up lots of uh, uh, mortar mix and plaster and so forth. And we were under a fume hood trying to run some assays for endotoxin. When they started doing the work in my lab, the endotoxin assays went totally wild. Nothing made <laughs> sense whatsoever. Well, you know, after several months, I guess, uh, we figured out it was really the dust that they were stirring up from drilling and this uh, plaster and so forth that was traveling through the air, getting into our assay, and upsetting the endotoxin assay. So we had several months of research to throw out because it was meaningless. But we learned some valuable lessons. That's right, and that, that's the key thing there, you know, was not all for, all for naught. And, and I guess some of the techniques that we uh, developed during and worked on, perfected during that time, opened so many doors uh, along the way. You know, again, uh, the hormone assays, again, made us realize they were really, uh, you know, there were uh, several human labs which were measuring for hormones in blood, but uh, the blood from domestic animals, some of them would work okay, mm -hmm. some of them would not. There's something different, and difference in hormone concentrations, difference in substances in the blood, and many of the assays being used in human labs would not work in domestic animals. So, yeah, right. really, working with clinicians, we had to go through elaborate procedures of trying to perfect the assays and be sure that they're measuring what we said we were measuring and uh, and their results were reproducible so it took years of work but lots of input from clinicians both small animal and large blessing providing samples <coughs> excuse me of animals they suspected with endocrine problems but really were not sure right they, right some evidence but the, the hormonal assays were uh, answers that were very critical uh, in their needs so over the years and over a lifetime it developed and uh, was very fruitful for developing our own careers and uh, and you know the things that we learned in all of these other projects every one of them almost contributed in some way to something that would come up in the future right yeah and that's the goal and that's the goal right. and, that, and uh, you know the uh, the procedures that we may use for measuring blood flow to the organs and and measuring plasma mediators, prostaglandins and leukotrienes were just being discovered at that time. Okay. Well, it was great, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, anyway, we got involved in those. Well, you know, after that, uh, and, you know, the, all through the years, the hormone assay lab was being developed, and, uh, um, oh, I'd say uh, 
Uh, following the Vietnam War, there was really uh, strong evidence that large other countries were having large stockpiles of nerve gases and other uh, gases that were could be used and might be used in, in future wars. So there was a great push, and the, and the Department of Defense, uh, Defense uh, sent out a request for proposals to determine the pathological effects, effects of soman poisoning in combination with hypovolemic or endotoxic shock. Well, those two words really caught my attention, and I thought, you know, we're doing hemorrhagic shock and endotoxic shock, and and uh, we can incorporate some soman. I don't know anything about soman, but I'm sure they'll treat, teach me and uh, teach me and uh, provide information. So I responded to their proposal, the Department of Defense request for a proposal, uh, and uh, and submitted a proposal on the effects of soman poisoning in combination with hypovolemic and endotoxic shock, and was able to use the techniques that we had used in all previous experiments to justify these experiments, to follow the hemodynamic parameters, respiratory parameters, and blood flow parameters, and, and uh, plasma mediator changes that occurred. And, uh, you know, this, and the, I was fortunate that the project was funded. It supplied very nice funding for four years for our lab and allowed us to conduct the experiments under very, very controlled conditions and uh, it was very fruitful years for us. Good. So here again, thing, uh, opportunities opened up because of the groundwork that we had done in previous years. Right, right. And at the same time, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you hear, you, well, there's, not everything's dull in the lab. There's lots of things to laugh about and, and have fun. And we did as a group work for years in the lab, and we really had had a good time with lots of good technical help and other professors, and uh, so it, it was hard times, busy times, but very fruit times, and we had fun as we went along. Good. Well, you want to make a comment about that one, that uh, project, the NIH, on the uh, al acute alcohol intake? Yeah, yes, yeah. it is. This, yeah. uh, again, a, it was a good project. Of, uh, you know, we were doing all of these types of experiments, and I remembered in my childhood, well, my during my youthful years and growing up throughout life that, you know, you would always hear these wives' tales about, uh, oh, uh, this individual survived a, a critical accident, and the only reason he, uh, where severe hemorrhage was involved and trauma, and the only reason he survived was because he was intoxicated at the time of the accident. Well, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> That wasn't very strong evidence, but it, not it, really. <laughs> was the tales that were going on? That was sure. the, you would hear. I thought, well, I wonder what the scientific literature has to do. And you know, you may have helped me on this review of the literature, Katie. I know you helped me so much on so much of the literature researches that I did. But I remember, uh, you know, we started searching literature about what's been done in, in regard to uh, intoxication and hemorrhage, and really there was not any very clear cut evidence that we could find in literature. You know, there was ancillary experiments, but nothing that really addressed the subject. So I thought, I'll just submit a research proposal to the NIH. I did, and fortunately, again, this is one of the highlights of your career when you get word from the NIH or DOD or any other federal right. that they've funded, will fund your project. Uh, and this, this was great time. So uh, they did fund our project, and uh, Oh, uh, the, the lab was full of people, and we had a great time. And we didn't drink the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but For it, research only, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it uh, served a lot to last, and we had lots of fun doing it. And again, we had the techniques down to measure the parameters that we wanted to, and we had statisticians to help us with the statistics and analyze the data. So we had team working and we had electron microscopists that do the tissue examination for us so we had a team of people that they were not used all the time but they would plug in along the way anytime we need assistance and uh, and uh, cooperation was just great so anyway the uh, the alcohol experiment turned out great uh, we had lots of fun doing the project and uh, uh, fortunately we did uh, you know quite often your data is not 
uh, totally clear cut and, and very positive. But this experiment turned out uh, there was no question about the results that we obtained, and the results were published. And uh, uh, and uh, let me assure the people, and, and we did in our paper that. Uh, intoxication would not enhance your ability to survive a severe trauma situation which involved a lot of hemorrhage. In fact, it was very detrimental to having blood levels of alcohol at that time. Yeah. So uh, these are some of the highlights along the way, Katie, uh, that we had. Uh, That's very, very good. Do you want to um, just switch gears just a little bit? The um, your involvement with the University Senate and also the grad school. Make a couple comments on that. Yes, okay. I will, okay. uh, and I'd be glad to. Uh, okay. You know, uh, oh, uh, something else on the research. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, I, when the research, you know, later in my career, things were better under control, and I had a little more time to kind of get involved and. In, University activities and other things, and, and this is interesting. So, and I did uh, serve on the Senate. Uh, I mean, well, uh, really, I was on the Life Science Area Committee with the Graduate School for some time, and uh -huh. uh, uh, had was involved with the Graduate School quite a bit there. And and uh, I remember we had a an appeal that came to the Graduate School from one area of the sciences in which there was a conflict between. Uh, uh, the staff and the student, and uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, I happened to be sitting at the place where I got to be chairman of that committee. Well, it was a uh, it was a, a real experience, an eye-opening experience, and and we did conduct the hearings, and I won't say anything more on that, but uh, I think, uh, but anyway, we uh, that completed, and I enjoyed my contact there, and. Then after my serve on the Life Science Area Committee, then I was asked by the dean of the graduate school because they had uh, uh, representatives from different areas of the university to serve as, as assistant deans and represent their areas. So I happened to be selected for the life science areas, and I believe there were four assistant deans at the time. So, uh -huh. uh, and, and I was representing life science area. And again, it was uh, three years again. Uh, I, I spent about a fourth of my time at the graduate school, and the rest of the time back in the veterinary school with my research and teaching. And uh, it was a pleasant experience right. at times, but uh, I spent three years there. I guess I learned one valuable lesson there that I really wasn't cut out to be an administrator. <laughs> and I got you on the on the job experience. <laughs> on the job experience. There but, you go. Right. Uh, taking care of my own business was was hard enough, but trying to take care of mine and some problems of others is, is just more than big, I big big challenge. Right. Yeah. Um, Dr. Bombs, you got several awards. You uh, want to make a couple of comments, particularly start with that Beecham Award for Excellence that you got. Talk uh, about some of the awards that you received. Okay, I guess uh, I don't have those before, but, uh, you, know, you know, I... The Alumni Faculty Award for Excellence is wonderful. Yeah, well, I guess I, I went to Purdue at the right time, and, and things fell in the right time, and I was able to get what I consider, and I guess some other people consider it a, a nice research program going. Right. And the key to it was... I think was the cooperation yeah. we involved so many people within the school and also within across the university that uh, we really had lots of research going on for that day and I probably wouldn't compare it to the result that's going on today at all because I guess that's why we retire and go into other things. We find out that we've outlived our usefulness and you better go to greener <laughs> pastures. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Darn <laughs> Anyway, uh, yes, the, the Beecham Award for Excellence in Research, again, uh, we had quite a very nice, for the day and for the time, research activities going on in the school, and it was very fortunate that this was uh, uh, very early when Beecham started uh, awarding uh, these uh, annually, uh, an award for excellence in research in the school, and uh, I was fortunate in 1986 to be nominated, and uh, by some kind not, uh, uh, person, I guess. I don't really know the details. But anyway, I did receive the award and uh, was very pleased to get it. And uh, my wife and uh, 
some of my children were there, and, and it was very nice. Yes, they are. They're very nice. I was talking, what about family? Can you make some comment? Uh, about your, did your you children went to Purdue? Yes, they did. Okay. Uh, they, uh, you know, we were very happy. And Purdue had an excellent problem, a program where uh, employees of Purdue, their children got a break in tuition. And, right. and again, you know, we loved to have our children at home. We lived at Purdue right there on the, and it was very nice for them to stay home as long as we keep them home. And we, we, we like to have them there. So, yes, they, uh, all three of my children went to school at Purdue. Uh, uh, my son and my youngest daughter graduated from Purdue. My oldest daughter went to her uh, first two years at Purdue in the pre-med uh, curriculum and then was admitted to optometry school after two years of pre-med at Purdue, and she went through optometry school. and. Uh, uh, she met a young engineer while she was at Purdue uh, before she in her first two years, and uh, they dated throughout Purdue, and then she went to IU for optometry school, and on, he graduated from engineering school two years before she finished optometry school. But she finished, after four years of optometry school, she finished, and he had moved to California, so they got married, and she immediately moved to California, and she's been very out there since then, and uh, okay. we're still very, very close, and she had, Good. Uh, That's and nice. That's good. My son, you know, uh, some of the highlights in, in my career at times, uh, I was interested in flying airplanes. I, I was going to ask about that. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't a golfer. I wasn't an alcoholic. I didn't drink, uh, and I decided I wouldn't fly an airplane. Well, a no marvelous program there where... Sure is. You could t take your pilot's training for there. And I did, uh, started there, and, and you know, it uh, was something that I never visualized I'd had the opportunity to do, but the opportunity was there before me. All I had to do was take advantage of it. And I guess one of the happiest days of my life, Katie, was the day that I soloed. No, I bet. Oh, and, yeah. It was uh, quite uneventful. I'd had only eight or nine hours, I believe, of training in the airplane, and I had no idea. The instructor, uh, we were doing touch and goes at the airport, and he said, and we started down, and made said, when you get down, pull over, because we do just touch and go back. He'd practice the landings and takeoffs. And mm -hmm. uh, he said, uh, taxi over the taxiway when we get down here. He said, you won't do what I tell you to do flying anyway, so I'm just going to get out and let you have the plane. <laughs> That's the way he told me it's going to make me solo. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> he pulled off the runway and he got out of the plane and gave me a few instructions, you know, just to go back, stay in the traffic pattern, go up and make touch and go landings. And he said, I'll stand right here beside the runway. And if uh, if things are not going well, I'll motion for you to come in. If they're going <laughs> well, I'll maybe to take off and, and make another one. <laughs> oh, uh, that's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> and then pick me up on your next uh, flyover, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. My wife and my mother-in-law was there that day. I, we had no idea, but they just happened to come up and watch me fly. Oh. We're standing at the airport, and my, some of my children, and they saw me solo. So that was a highlight oh, that's nice. in my career. It was, was really, really, really special. Right, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and Katie, you know, it took some time, and... Uh, but I used it a lot, and, you know, we all talk about our therapy, but that was as good a therapy as I could get. When I pressed, things were not going well, and needed some, some place to think I could get in that airplane, and it's a beautiful day, and it's quiet, and drive around, and that was the best therapy in the world. Very but, good. That's right. You and you and the nature and up in the skies. It's okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Because uh, we, our home was in Oklahoma, and we uh, flew to Oklahoma a number of times. I had a wealth of experiences on those trips flying to Oklahoma, but you don't have time for that. But it was was fun. It was therapeutic. It was uh, my family enjoyed it most of the time. Sometimes they they didn't care for it. But again, not only that, but I used it a lot in flying to sure. meetings. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, what about um, let's talk about retirement? What are you um, you decide to retire, and then you decided to go to Texas rather than Oklahoma? Yes, I did. Oh. Uh, you know, my wife and I were both from the Southwest, and uh -huh. we're both Oklahoma. And uh, my wife was having a number of medical problems. 
the cold environment was really bothering her a lot. And, and again, all of our children had graduated college and uh, had uh, moved away, and we were alone in Lafayette, and we decided that when we retired, we'd move back to the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, you know, considered Oklahoma very much, but really our mothers and fathers, most of our family was gone. We had lots of friends there, but uh, we had a daughter and, and a granddaughter in Texas, and uh, we decided that's close enough. So we, uh, uh, when we retired from Purdue, uh, we decided, and I had a daughter in California. We also uh, considered California, but uh, houses were very expensive at the time. But I probably would have been ahead if I'd have gone ahead to move, because uh, I know my daughter tried to get me a buy a house across the street from her or uh, in the same block. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it was terribly expensive. It was $300,000 house. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I can't afford a house like that. No. Well, I didn't buy it. I came to Texas. The house were a lot cheaper then than Bowen, Texas. But, you know, it wasn't five years to that $300,000 house that I started buying in California sold for a million dollars. So Ooh. I made a blunder there maybe. But <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Sure. Yeah. And right. we enjoyed our life here with uh, close enough to get back to Oklahoma. And again, you know, uh, my wife was in poor health, but again, she would love to travel, and we were able to travel. Unfortunately, my son was a professional pilot at the time, and, and still is. And uh, by the way, he took advantage of my flying, too. He was always my co pilot. He was from a very young kid, and it's, I don't know, in junior high. He was my co-pilot, and he would fold my maps for me. He would tune the radios. He did. He was lots of help. Oh yeah. My wife and two daughters would sit in the back seat, and he would sit in the front seat with me as my co-pilot. And uh, so it was quite an experience. And he had followed that career, and uh, uh, so far he's uh, he really enjoys his career. And but anyway, my wife and I did lots of traveling uh, during our early years of retirement uh, uh -huh. to Texas. Uh, we really traveled the world. We uh, uh, didn't go around the world, but we went in all different directions and took advantage of it. Took advantage of it. Right. And, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, the, then I lost my wife uh, eight years later, but we had a great eight years, and uh, I lost her in in '06. And uh, uh, you know, this is probably the well, no doubt about it. The most drastic thing that ever happened in my life. Uh, it's hard. But, but uh, because of family support and friends and pleasant memories and our life of challenges, uh, I managed to go on and every day is really another challenge. Right. But right. support of family and children has been uh, great throughout my life. Right. And there, that's key. That's the key, the big lynch. Oh, yeah. The link. That's yeah. right. Yes. You know, uh, those lessons you learn very early in life and uh, uh, you, you know you just learn the importance of family and family That's right exactly shall we get to the Purdue uh, you got a Purdue tradition and uh, or an, an outstanding event hello you hear me hello dr. bottoms Hello, Katie. Yeah, are you okay? Oh, can you can you hear me? The battery must have gone down on my phone. Okay. Let me get, pick up another phone. Okay. Katie. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. The phone not as good as the other one, but I can. All I right. can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, Purdue uh, tradition. Do you want to share one with us and an outstanding event? Uh, I think Purdue, you mentioned what, that one. Uh, Purdue, uh, what, what was your first? The uh, tradition, any tradition at Purdue that sticks in your mind, like maybe oh. uh, homecoming or? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Some, uh, well, really, um, oh, uh, yeah, uh, around Purdue, you know, I guess I'll never forget Slater Hill. You know, there were no there buildings on Slater Hill other than Slater Center, and that was a favorite spot to go sledding in the wintertime with good. your family. Very good. So we spent lots of time sledding on, 
uh, near on Slater Hill, which is wide open and uh, sure. uh, perfect for sledding. And, and still uh, is. Yeah, is it? Okay. Oh, yeah, they great. still do that. A right. lot of buildings, a lot of buildings in the way now, and those buildings are not there at the time, but <laughs> that's progress. So, right. And again, uh, uh, you know, some other outstanding events while I was there. Good. Uh, I guess. Uh, as a result of the research activities that we were going, I was invited to travel to Amsterdam to present uh, some of my work on uh, that I was doing at the time, made on endotoxin, measuring endotoxins and so forth. So uh, I was able to travel to Amsterdam. My wife went with me. We had a, a marvelous meeting there, great time. And so that was, that was really a highlight. And, Very good. Uh, after the meeting in Amsterdam, it was a week long, and then uh, really my wife didn't come over till the meeting, scientific meeting was over, then she came over and met me, and we toured Europe for two weeks after that. Oh, and, how nice. And That's... had a marvelous, that was outstanding. Yeah. You know, a couple of years later, I was invited to Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, on uh, There was an con international conference on uh, uh, leukotrienes and prostaglandins and health and disease. and. Uh, Oh, it was a marvelous experience. Uh, unfortunately, my wife didn't get to go with me at that time, and we had planned to go later, but we never got the opportunity sure. to go later, to go back later. That was a highlight uh, during my time. And, you know, at Purdue, I'll never forget the all the activities and music programs they had at the Elliott Hall of Music. Uh, lots of outstanding speakers that came there uh, occasionally that were quite interesting to to hear, and uh, so I enjoyed those very much. I enjoyed the Purdue football games, and uh, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, I think my son, I'd, you know, we'd had two tickets, and uh, one of my children would go with me one time, and another one would go with me the next time, but uh, my son used to go, and he was a young man, and he went there to eat, I think, and I remember <laughs> some people <laughs> talking about it after about how well he enjoyed eating while the football game was going on, but don't we all a little? Yeah, that's right, exactly. So I guess those are well, that's highlights, good. and again, I guess the other highlight was the day I soloed in the Cessna 172. That's a day I'll never forget. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'll, in closing, I'll let you make any final uh, any closing comments that you'd like to share with us. I think you've done oh, really well. Uh, uh, or something I, uh, I, I may have left out. Uh, I uh, can't think of anything uh, right off hand. I, I guess, uh, you know, the memories that I have for Purdue, I enjoy every opportunity that I get to come back. Although things have changed so much in the <laughs> department, everyone's, so many people retired that were there. But sure. again, uh, you're uh, able to make lots of contacts. I really enjoy return visits there. Yeah, it was nice to come for the 50th, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it for the 50th. Oh, I got okay. there because, again, I had already planned a, a trip the week oh, okay. later, okay. and I didn't come up, but I got there a week after the 50th yeah. and uh, did get to see a lot of people and had a great time. Uh, so I enjoy the fond memories that I have. I enjoy coming back there. And I enjoy telling these tales about the experiences we had in Purdue. And I didn't tell you all of them, but uh, I guess uh, they can wait for another time. We may uh, do a follow-up on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Bond. It's just been great, and I appreciate the opportunity very, very much. And I appreciate the material that you sent. I, I enjoyed reading it very much. Well, thank you so much, okay. Katie. I must tell you, uh -huh. uh, your, your contact to me and asking me to do this was a stimulus that really I, it caused me to stop and sit and think about things that happened in my lifetime and career. So you helped me a lot by causing me to sit down and think about these things that occurred and try to recall them and put them in order. So uh, it was a great pleasure in trying to think about uh, what happened during all this? They went so fast. Right. Well, but, uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to do this and give me a chance to organize and think about the things that I had, had done over the years. Right. You did a good job, and I really appreciate that. And you'll ultimately get a copy of the transcript, and you can make the changes before we put it up on our website. Oh, that's okay. marvelous. Okay. I, I appreciate it so much, Katie, and I Thank enjoy visiting with you, and I'll never forget all the help that you gave me the time I was there. Well, I learned a lot from you, so we were a two-person two team there. 
Right. <laughs> you were part of a large group. <laughs> uh, well, okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, and take care, and we'll keep in touch. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.